Okay, moving right along. Our next guest, Brian Dickinson. Brian, Brian's parents uh, set up New Zealand's largest civilian UFO investigation group in 1954 and ran it until 1981. During the 60s, Brian began helping his parents both as a field investigator and as a contributor to the quarterly publication Xenologue. He emigrated to Sydney in 1978 and has investigated UFO cases in New South Wales since then. He then helped UFO research New South Wales with Maura McGee and Paul Saliak. At present, he is an editor with that group's UFO reporter. Brian now has a particular interest in investigating UFO abduction cases and is the 1996 spokesperson for the Australian Abduction uh, Research Project, a grouping of several New South Wales and New Zealand organisations which provide abductee support and share their findings in a non-political environment. Brian investigated his first UFO abduction case in New Zealand in 1978, a few months after a large UFO flap in Gisborne. This seemed to be a classic abduction involving a blonde Nordic type alien. So ladies and gentlemen, would you now make welcome Mr. Brian Dickinson. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Now, first of all, there are two things I'd like to do fairly quickly. Uh, the first is to thank UFO Research Queensland for inviting me here today, and also for the wonderful show that I've put on. I think it's been very, very positive and very good effects. And uh, I think it's been a wonderful exercise all around. I know I've been congratulated. The second thing I'd like to do is also to say that actually coming here was something that, uh, a bit of a shock, a bit of a surprise for me because it was mentioned in the opening that uh, I investigated my first UFO ca uh, abduction case in 1978 in New Zealand. Um, I wasn't that totally traumatised by that experience. And in fact, the person who I uh, first investigated in that abduction uh, is here today. I haven't seen her for 18 years. Uh, Bev Parsons was that particular person associated with that particular incident. And uh, it's interesting because at the time I tried hypnotic regression, but very, very badly. Uh, very little was actually known about hypnotic regression procedures. I've never had any hypnotherapy uh, experience. I have, in fact, picked up a bit of hypn uh, hypnosis experience from a very good friend of my parents who uh, was actually a contactee for, for 11 or 12 years in New Zealand. And as a party trick, used to occasionally sort of hypnotise people. Now, this gentleman, I'd seen him do his act several times, and I tried out on Bev, and it kind of worked. Except that after a few minutes, we got to sort of kind of an impasse. We got to one of these things called a shunt, which is kind of like a, uh, a, um, almost a psychological brick wall that's brought down and people can't remember it further. A few years later than that, in actual fact, Bev, when Bev was over in Australia, she was uh, approached by a couple of investigators in uh, New South Wales and South Australia to, to undergo further hypnosis. They used a new technique coming out that had come out from the United States at that time. It was much more successful. It was a lot more traumatic for Bev. And actually, in fact, I remember the day because I was actually meant to be there at that abduction um, interview uh, regression at that time and said it could be because uh, I was at a function. Um, it was a, a seminar for a technical writer by trade. So uh, uh, Bev was actually re uh, hypnotized on the second occasion on, by Bill Chalker and Keith Basterfield on the 21st and 22nd of October 1989. I've never forgotten it. The case is actually mentioned very briefly in Bill Chalker's recent book, The Oz Files, which has been out for a couple of months. And I haven't seen any copies of it up here yet, but uh, I'm quite surprised it is mentioned yeah. in that. Now, okay, to the subject in hand. I want to talk quickly today about UFO abduction research in New South Wales. I've entitled it, or subtitled it, A Report from the Fringe. Uh, basically, I want to look at uh, two things. Basically, give an account of what we've been doing, look at a few reasons why I think UFO groups in Australia should be involved in UFO, uh, in UFO abduction research, if they're not already involved, that is, and to, to look at uh, a few other things beyond the usual bounds that we normally like to, to cover. Now, all of you, of course, have read a few accounts of UFO abductions. That's probably why you're here today with this particular session. It's, um, to start, I'm just any, are any of you here involved in UFO abduction research? How many people in the audience? No one? Oh. oh, one, sorry, one, sorry, of course. Um, uh, the other question I'd like to ask, but of course I can't really for ethical reasons, is how many of you think about UFO abductees? Well, I'm not going to ask that. 
All right, first of all, the very few accounts that you've probably heard about in Australia are just, in fact, only a very few of the publicised accounts that, that are actually available in Australia. What we found here in the last couple of years in working in this area is that we have a wide range of abduction activity in Australia, an extremely wide range. In fact, how wide that range is, I think we've seen where to find out. And it's pretty much similar to what was being found overseas, of course, some very important local variations. The, a few of the unpublicised cases are every bit as good, for example, as the Kelly Carl case and the Longley case, which we've been recently, uh, recently uh, working with in New South Wales. Uh, John Octi was particularly been working on that uh, Longley case as well. Now, first of all, what I'd like to do is, is looking at abductions, you find that there's a lot of elements in abductions that are fairly similar. There's, uh, you know, certain things come out in one abduction case that are similar to another case. And some, you know, uh, what you find, in fact, that it's like having a, a set number of keys on the piano, black and white keys. You play an infinite number of variations, an infinite number of tunes on these, but there's, there's basically only sort of a set number of keys. And it's very rarely that you actually find that there's another key on the keyboard. But rather than actually sort of go through the different elements on the keyboard, given that we don't know really whether we've got all the keys or not at this stage, I'd like us to look a bit beyond the keyboard and what's actually going on. I want to particularly look at what we're finding out, what UFO abductors appear to be doing, as opposed to what they're telling the abductees they're doing and why they're doing it. It's probably much more interesting on this occasion. And I also want to do this because I think it's important. Um, I think that uh, UFO abductions are important and that, as I've said, Australian groups should research them. Um, I think that UFO abductees um, have only recently come to public attention, but in fact, they, they seem to be a much, much older phenomenon than we first imagined. I want to look at some reasons for that. Uh, there's some very important implications too on the very large number of UFO abductions that are now being found and being reported. And I'd like to look at some of the, perhaps some of the risks and some of the benefits of UFO abduction research for the different groups who might want to investigate them. Now, if you've been in the UFO business for any length of time, you start to appreciate that this area really does sort of depend very much on the influence of a few people at any one time. Individuals and occasionally organisations have a huge influence on how the whole thing is perceived, how it's presented and reported to the public. Of course, what the media they do with that is something entirely else, but uh, what we try to do is, uh, what you do will find is that certain key people at different times are absolutely essential. And I think in this case, uh, UFO abductions, of course, most of our material still comes from the States and probably continue to do so for quite a while to come. However, there are very important um, inputs, I believe, that local people can make to that process. And I really want us to look at, first of all, um, what's ha what we've been doing. Because basically, when you, as I've said, when you're looking at this sort of phenomenon, it, it helps, I think, if you understand where we as an organisation, perhaps where I've been coming from, where we're all coming from with, the, with this business, to get an idea of what we're doing now, get some idea of where we're hopefully going to, and give you appreciation of, of what has happened. The, the, first of all, the present incarnation of UFO research in New South Wales arose in November 1991. Uh, some seven months later, in mid-1992, there was an interim committee for UFO research and we've been approached by a number of people to undertake abduction research in New South Wales. Um, we, the, the committee members decided that uh, three members of that committee would form a subgroup and that uh, this subgroup or special interest group would try and develop and coordinate a long-term support and research strategy for UFO research. It seems reasonable. Now, at first, of course, we made very slow progress. We were doing other things. There was a lot, you know, getting an organisation up and running takes a lot of organising. And we, things were running fairly quietly. And then a few months later, um, Gary Wiseman uh, organised a tour of Australia by Bud Hopkins. He came to Sydney. He also came to Brisbane, I believe. And uh, Bud Hopkins came out to, to Sydney, spoke there for one weekend. The effect, I think, is really quite devastating on us. We just suddenly realised, hey, you know, this, you know, there's a whole area out there of stuff that we're willing to catch up on very, very quickly. Uh, in mid-October 1992, Bud Hopkins visited Sydney. He spoke at our seminar at the High Kingsgate Hotel in King's Cross. 
And um, he talked about what he had been doing and other researchers had been doing, people like Leo Sprinkle, what they'd been doing in the United States in the area of uh, UFO abduction research. He described the methodologies being used, uh, the way in which they use confidentiality, hypnotic theory being a mutual support to, uh, to, to redevelop missing abduction memories and rehabilitate abductees. Now, I think that throughout this seminar, we're actually contacted by a number of people who said, yes, we're abductees, we'd like to talk to you about it. And uh, afterwards, we thought, oh my God, what are you going to do with all these people who suddenly come forward? We're about 30 people in Sydney. Um, we had 30, we want to try other groups involved as well, and probably about another 30 or so. So there are about 60 people that potentially for us to talk to. And um, we tried to set up some, some criteria. <laughs> To, to run an organisation, now run a, spe a, spe a special interest group for UFO research. Now, UFO abduction research it tends to be very controversial, it tends to be very political, it tends to be very volatile. Um, overseas, for example, Bufora in the United Kingdom ha has actually put embargoes on studying UFO um, abductions because it creates so much dissent and so much controversy in its own ranks. That's a mature, well developed group. Then to have those kinds of difficulties indicates the kinds of problems you have. Okay, um, of course, after about another year or so, we in fact also had a bit of a dust up. There's like all kinds of shenanigans going on. Um, because I'm so close to it, it's very, really inappropriate for me to go into the details. It really depends on who you listen to. So I just sort of say that typically, like many other UFO groups before uh, and since, we had problems. There was actually a major schism developing in UFO research, and the uh, breakaway group forming a UFO experience support association just did nothing with our black Ds, and many others of us who just sort of stayed on UFO research, gradually dragged ourselves back up into some sort of um, semblance of a group and got ourselves up and running again. Now, we also decided to have another go with UFO abduction research. You think we'd never learn. Um, we found that, okay, we decided to run a support group. We had difficulties with those, the support groups were infiltrated uh, by the other group. Uh, we had loss of confidentiality because we couldn't really guarantee confidentiality for our members. We had to scrap that group. We're now in our third incarnation once more of a UFO abducting support group. This gives you an idea of the complexities that can develop. Now, what we're developing now is really a, a, a buddy system whereby people who are investigators are encouraged to try and look for signs of possible abductions and abduction incidents, to try and develop that information in those areas, provide, find out if those people need support, pass information on to us, we can either provide one-to-one -one support, telephone support, whatever, information on abductions. And then, in terms of pr providing research, then as investigators, we will sort of, we will then sort of talk to each other on the next level up. You know, we don't necessarily mention then the names of the people we're dealing with, one to one who are possibly abductees. But for research purposes, we then discuss you know, just what has happened particular, on particular sort of cases. They don't necessarily mention the people, sort of details that sort of um, infringe their, uh, that might infringe their confidentiality. And we try and provide a free flow of information on, that, uh, on researchers who also deal with abductions uh, to provide the information that we need. Now, okay, let's look first of all then at some of the information we've been particularly looking at. And I guess. Once again, from an historical development, we had to go back to people like you know, Hopkins' material that he first came out to us in uh, those years ago, and uh, before our trouble sort of began. Now, one of the important things that Hopkins mentioned, for example, was the, what's called the Roper Survey. This is a survey in the United States, which seemed to indicate that about 2% of, of Americans had been abducted. Now, of course, in the United States, that works out to about 5 million Americans may have had some kind of abduction experience. This was based on a rather elaborate poll in which five questions were embedded in the questionnaire that various people were asked, and the results were that uh, surprising 2%. Um, the figures were in fact so incredibly high. They thought they might get one or two out of the thousand or so, a couple of thousand people who were interviewed. They got a surprising number of full, you know, everyone answered yes to the five critical questions. And this sort of represents something like in excess of 10,000 times more than they really expected to get. Now, this is, this is really getting into, into, into the big time. Okay, then. In Australia, then, with this information, looking at the Roman report, 
uh, we've sort of made the assumption that like Australia and the United States are probably fairly similar. Um, they probably have the same sorts of numbers of abductees that, uh, that we have. So the sort of numbers that we're looking at are, uh, are really quite, are quite high. And it's important that I think you see these figures because um, uh, it's when, you know, one or two percent doesn't seem like much. But when you're actually looking at the numbers involved, as you said, they become quite high. Now, this is based, this is the table of figures based on the, the present um, Bureau of Statistics of Australia. Because it's New Zealand, I've had to take a punt of the New Zealand population, there being three and three quarter million. I'll provide the same sorts of figures. Now, according to Hopkins, originally, okay, New South Wales have over just over six million people. We have potentially 123,100 abductees. In uh, let's go to a really important case, Queensland, for example, the population of three and one third million people, you have potentially sixty-six and a half thousand abductees, people being abducted. If you look at two percent of the population, Tasmania, we can't forget them, population of almost half a million, nine and a half thousand abductees. New Zealand, seventy-five thousand abductees. So you're looking at very big numbers. Now, okay. When you look at these sorts, okay, now that's if you look at Hopkins. Recently, more recently, Dr. Mack has come out and says that he actually believes the numbers twice that. So, hey, in New South Wales, we've got a quarter of a million abductees. In, um, in Australia, overall, for example, under, under Hopkins, we have, say, 363,000 abductees. Under Dr. Mack, you suddenly have 727,000 abductees. You're talking big numbers here. And of course, this immediately raises a problem. Where on earth are all these people? Why don't we see more of them? Can we be so stupid, so blind as investigators that we're completely, you know, that we're just totally off the planet ourselves with regard to this phenomenon? Now, in actual fact, a lot of, you know, what we did find, the checking on a lot of the notes the field investigators have been keeping, that some of them sort of did have, you know, once we sort of knew the clues to look for, did, did these, we did have the kind of um, figures which indicated there were probably more cases out there that we haven't really pursued properly. We didn't have sort of the right mindset, the right way of approaching it, the right methodology to use to look for, for abductees or abduction type experiences. And um, so, okay, we need to have a look at, um, you know, why, why, for example, this whole thing, you know, how could we have missed the boat so badly? Now, one area that you've got to look at, as, you, as has been indicated by other speakers this weekend, is you start to look at models and um, as an aid to helping you with the, what, what the work that you're doing. And of course, are there some, you start to ask yourself, are there sort of similar areas of activity or phenomena in this country where the same sort of uh, things occur, where you might have the same sort of suppression or ignorance of what is actually going on? And of course, it turns out that there are. One important model that I'd like to look at, and it's, um, it actually turns out to be particularly well suited for this, this, this uh, comparison, is the model of what we might call sexual abuse. I say it's particularly suited because studies in the United States from various times have shown that abductees who come to uh, investigate them with, with uh, abduction experience problems have a similar sort of mental framework to many sexual abuse victims. And um, they have the same sort of dissociation between mind and body, the same sort of, um, uh, let me start, put them down here. But they have, um, uh, where are we? Yeah, they have the same dissociation in mental processes. They have um, a certain um, vagaries, or I should say this, the vagaries of, of, of the psychology and the mental makeup. And uh, it turns out that this is a particularly useful model to use. Now, if you start looking at, okay, we've seen that this is the same chart that I showed you before with abductees. Let's look at the same sort of area. Same chart before. What I've done here is I've now provided figures, what I might call, you know, the same sort of figures that we now that are known in this country for people sexual abuse. Of course, it's a very fashionable topic at the present with the all sorts of law commissions going on in New South Wales, but some just reflecting that fashion, I don't know. It also provides, still provides a very good model. Um, okay, 
what you really look at for the figures for sexual abuse, essentially what, what we're being told by, by um, social workers is that probably, so one in three females and one in ten males experience some sort of sexual abuse, uh, varying levels, varying complexities. Um, and that translates into about 21% of the population overall. In other words, it's about five, well, five, to, well, if you're using men, it's five times more of what you might call the annual abduction. It's the figures that we'd expect. Or if you're using Hopkins, and perhaps I'll stick to him because it's a bit more conservative, I think it's important to use really conservative here. If you use Hopkins figure, then you're talking about something, figures which are sort of ten times the number of what you would expect. Um, interesting thing that in the States where they have actually got the, the same sorts of figures is that uh, where they've all, already done the work on things like profiling what the, the mindset of an abductor is, um, they've sort of they've occasionally talked about abduction experiences, they've talked about, and they've, they've, people have noted the comparison to sexual abuse victims, um, but none has actually sort of said, hey, perhaps we look at the same kind of phenomenon, perhaps alien abuse is actually a kind of sexual abuse. And uh, we're going to start looking at the sorts of alien abuse, sorry, the alien abduction experience, you find that really, to a large extent, they have many of the same qualities. There are a lot of, you know, just as um, most um, sexual abuse shows say occurs before the age of 21, uh, the same sort of thing happens with alien abuse or alien abductions. It happens very early on, um, and, and it shows them very many of the same characteristics. It's probably a very valuable model indeed. Um, what I would like to have a look at is, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a very useful model. Then again, it provides other insight as well. If you look then, okay, sexual abuse, it's a very factual subject in some ways. It's not necessarily a very nice subject, we don't always like talking about it, but it's there. Um, you find a very, very, some very valuable clues in the same area. See, sexual abuse, in fact, has been known about in quite in these high sorts of numbers for a very, very long time. If you go, if you look, for example, back uh, just uh, actually over just over a century, in April 1896, Sigmund Freud presented a, ra a radically new theory of mental illness to the VME psychiatric establishment. His research had led him to believe that human neuroses were caused by exposure to various forms of sexual abuse in early childhood. Now, Freud's revolutionary paper on the seduction theory, as it was called, was met with complete silence by his peers when it was produced in April 1896, just over 100 years ago. The reason why it was found out a bit later was that, in fact, a lot of the people in Viennese society at the time were involved in the practice, did not particularly want to make it publicly known. So they actually imposed on said to Freud, look, you know, hey, you want to get on in Vienna society, first of all, you know, you're Jewish, secondly, you want to make impression, um, thirdly, you know, this is a new area that you really want to promote in a positive way, then you've got to change this. So Freud, in fact, rewrote, or re rejigged a whole lot of his material and represented it. The material he still produced was still sufficiently powerful to completely revolutionize the way we think. And in fact, it wasn't until much later that, um, People started to find, started to look up Freud's original work. Um, in in uh, some 18 years later, in the late 1970s, a gentleman called Jeffrey Masson, who was a product, a projects officer, I should say, in the Freud archives in Vienna, rediscovered Freud's early materials, notes, and his comments. He wrote a paper asserting that Freud had suppressed key findings in his early work, and uh, he had to part company with that particular organisation fairly soon afterwards. However, he wrote a book. In very brief, people write books. And his book had, in fact, had a significant influence. It's called The Assault on Truth. Um, I've actually read all of it. It's certainly worth, well, well worth looking at. Um, it's been written, I think, originally as an academic paper and then expanded into a book. So what you really need to do is only read half of it. Actually, or perhaps even a third of it. Everything you need to know is probably the first third. The rest of it is kind of repetition, just to, just to make it out into, into book size, probably to say. But it still contains some very good ideas. It sort of explains very carefully what things were like in Freud's day and really why his ideas uh, were not met very, very um, well indeed. So what you then have, you know, nowadays with a reassessment of Freud's work and also, interestingly,
interestingly enough, Masson's, Masson's book came along about the same time, of course, as Women's Live and the various uh, women's movement activities. It's, it, people are suddenly looking for this kind of information. So suddenly now you have the, these, uh, most people say, yes, sexual abuse is here, it's in, the, you know, it's in these sorts of levels uh, in our society, you know, it, it, it exists. So therefore, I would say that if it's possible for us to suppress something which occurs in 20% of the population for 18 years, 80 to 90 or 100 years, and it's perfectly possible for, for UFO investigators to miss something like alien abduction, which is a very similar phenomenon in many respects. And uh, in fact, there are other ramifications for this as well. When I look around me now at the um, UFO abduction research area, I find a lot of people are coming in and almost doing sort of like doing what happened to Freud. Like they're saying, oh, this is already rather nasty what these aliens are doing, what these abductors are doing to these abductees. It's already rather unpleasant. Let's try and sort of say, hey, let's make it some sort of positive experience somehow. Now, um, as I say, it's a very important indication. We are getting to a certain extent, uh, ex uh, extent I'm afraid, what I would call the whitewashing of the UFO abduction phenomenon. And that is a bit of a concern to me. People start to make it out that it's a, something that it, perhaps it isn't. It may in fact be a rather sort of unpleasant little phenomenon uh, that, involves some, uh, that, that I should say involves some external agency. It's something we should be a bit more careful about. Now, this is uh, not necessarily going to make very popular with a lot of abductees. I know that a number of them, um, especially as an abductee researcher, a lot of them sort of say, you know, say to, to abductive researchers, you simply cannot imagine the feelings of love that I felt when I was being abducted. Um, this is rather difficult for me to say this, but for all the, for all the work I've been doing, I don't at this, far, at this stage really find any overall benefit to the abductees and the abduction phenomena. There are occasions, obviously, where some people may benefit in some sort of psychic awakening. But with many other people, that is sort of a two-edged sword. Okay, so something you can run around with everyone's mind. <coughs> now, one, well, you simply may not want to know what other people are thinking. It may be a bit of an embarrassment. It may have somehow set you apart from other people. It may affect the way in which you intermix with other people. So, you know, it's, it's really it's a two-edged sword. I, so I would, okay, I, would, I would say once again, in my view, the abduction research, the abduction phenomenon does not really benefit abductees. It is really there, therefore, for the benefit of the abductors, as far as I can see now. I'll keep on looking if I come across any sort of new material I'll let you know. But to my way of thinking, it's kind of it's really an exploitative activity. And that's a concern. Okay, right. Abduction researchers in the UFO, in the UFO field, we missed the bus. We can perhaps find an excuse for it and what's happened before. People like Freud had the same sort of trouble 100 years ago. Great. Are there other possibilities? If, if this thing, you know, still if you've got, say, like in New South Wales, 126,000 are people running around being abducted, are there other occasions when we might find outbreaks that, that, that this has served as in unexpected areas? The answer, of course, has to be yes. I came across last year. And you won't be able to read this, I'm afraid. Um, this astonishing article in the Sydney Morning Herald. The Sydney Morning Herald is not noted for its tendencies to write up UFO and abduction material. I sort of read this but largely because it's, it's, you know, the article itself, you can't quite see here, is actually about 40% headline, which of course makes it a bit sus. It also has one of the longest and probably one of the silliest titles I've ever come across. This man stands accused of raping his daughters, committing forced abortions, and being parties to systematic abuse. But he says his accusers are wrong. Now, this is an account one year old article offers some interesting insight into what, in fact, appears to be a much wider occurrence, a wider phenomenon we have been led to believe. The other interesting thing about this is this as well. That in what we may have here, is what I'm suggesting, is that, okay, we have, say, 20% of your population or thereabouts, one in five people, some sort of sexual abuse history. But probably, um, so one or, so let's say, um, 20 out of 100 people with some sort of sexual abuse history. Uh, let's say that of, uh, so one or, sorry, two of those people, 
could well be an induction type experiences. And so we've got sort of a phenomenon encrypted within a phenomenon, which I think is particularly interesting. And it's also interesting too because you can actually, and I've spent some time trying to follow this up, um, these things to a certain extent involve a kind of cost with the present political climate of trying to justify um, these sorts of unusual, uh, you know, all sorts of um, welfare support. You find, and I've, I've had two people on different occasions quote me the figure that have been <coughs> sexual abuse in Australia costs this country something like $44 million a year. That's in terms of the legal fees, in terms of docs providing resources and, and uh, therapists, in terms of medical services, that kind of thing, in terms of providing accommodation for these people and support, and the paperwork and bureaucracy and stuff like that. That means if, you, if it's costing Australia $44 million a year for sexual abuse victims, then, depending on if you say use, um, if you use Hopkins' uh, figures, then it's costing the country something like four and a half million dollars for alien abuse. But maybe cost the country four and a half million dollars alien abduction, shall we say, people experiences. In terms of the trauma, the medical care, that kind of thing, these people require the support. Of course, if you start looking at the, the cost in terms of what Mac has been, Max figure, it goes up to nine million. That's quite a lot of money. I'm sure some of us involved in abduction research would like to see some of that for our own study, would like to yeah. get involved in that. So there is a, I'm actually trying to check out the figure of 44 million. I've got two people quoted to me independently, and I've actually asked them where they get the figure from, so they quoted here today in the sense that they had written somewhere, they weren't quite sure where. I suspect it's in one of a number of papers that are currently being developed in various government departments. They haven't quite made their way to the search. It will probably come out in the next year or so. So you might see this figure. If anyone comes across it, written up in a newspaper or something like that, would you please let me know? Because I'd love to have a piece of concrete paper that I can sort of tag this figure onto. Now, as I've, as I've said, this view I'm taking that perhaps alien abduction and sexual abuse are in fact more intimately related than we'd like to think will not be a problem with UFO abductees. Um, I, th I think too that uh, it, it's, as, as I say, what I'm trying to do is I'm looking at what the aliens do, not what they tell us. And uh, I guess when I'm, uh, when I'm looking at this phenomenon, uh, I'm, looking, I'm looking, when I'm dealing with people, what the sort of stories they're telling me. Uh, even those people who have some sort of positive experiences don't particularly like the process they're going through. And um, on the whole, it seems to be a rather negative sort of process. Now, yes, I've already mentioned the fact that some researchers find the very high levels of UFO abduction appear to be going on unpalatable, and especially the negative aspects unpalatable, and therefore sort of dressing it up as some sort of you know, increased, uh, some increased awareness process. Um, perhaps not something that's being imposed on us from the outside at all. Uh, perhaps it's some sort of uh, interaction between you know, Mother Earth um, getting annoyed at us for sort of doing terrible things to the environment and sort of getting back. The guy, I'm not successful. But as I've said, really, from my, what I've been doing, from, from discussing with other people in New South Wales, there appears to be no overall benefit to the abductee of the abduction phenomenon. It seems to be benefiting the abductors. Now, there are some other interesting things that are going on as well. First of all, and I've checked this out to other investigators in New South Wales and Victoria, there are definite indications that the phenomenon um, can re engineer itself from within. It, this internal variability is often termed brainwashing, but, uh, and I've seen it in written up in one of Joe Overseas articles, but in actual fact, it appears to be part of the, the agencies in, 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 in bringing in the abductions. Um, re-engineering it in, in people's minds, in the abductees' minds. Um, basically, if you keep a record of, of, an, of an abduction experience, you find that important minute might evolve or change over time. It's a very real example of that recently. And um, this applies whether the therapy is used or not, and it tends to depend on the frequency of that re-abduction. Generally, in terms of trauma to the abductee, I suppose that to, you know, for minim to minimize trauma to the abductee, my recommendation is that they should be abducted early and often, rather than sort of later in life and only infrequently. This would be much, much more traumatic. Um, that's not a recommendation, sort of an observation, I suppose. Now, only part of the change that goes on in this evolving 
um, realigned with the abductee's uh, worldview is, is, um, is, is due to sort of internal feedback arising from the, the abductee reinterpreting what's happened to them in the light of your experience. When accepting their experience, you do get the impression that somehow, you know, and that some, that the, the phenomenon itself is being engineered by those who are actually organising it. We have obviously the very example, the very positive examples of the shunts, where someone can be taken and regressed to a particular point and something's no further. It's like a wall comes down, bang, no further. Sometimes these shunts disappear in time, you get another shunt further down the line. It's, uh, and these are obviously being very real psychological walls that are being put in place. Uh, in most case, cases, the re-engineering is sufficiently strong to to reduce, to actually reduce the effectiveness of an, of an investigation of an abductee's experiences for research purposes within about five or six interviews or five or six not regressions. So really the best information for research purposes that can get out of an abductee is fairly on the piece. Later on it gets re-engineered, rejected as the abductee sort of interacts with the phenomenon itself and reinterprets the phenomenon, what's happened to it. Like in inclusion, I do believe that abduction phenomena provide extremely valuable insights into the UFO phenomenon itself. Uh, I do think that the higher than expected levels of abduction we are finding may not be so unusual after all. Uh, and these have very important short and long term ramifications uh, which need to be investigated. I think that related phenomena such as sexual abuse, satanic abuse, and ritual abuse, probably other uh, popular phenomena such as um, angels, some of the new age aspects, and, and contactees. Are also a part of this re engineering, um, which sort of helped these people do what they want to do more easily. And they should also be uh, investigated as well. Um, and these insights I point out are not always making popular. I would also firmly say that the phenomenon will not, it is extremely complex, it, relies, uh, it operates on many levels, and it can modify its own activities. It also um, t tends to or it appears to respond to investigation. And research in this area requires a lot of resource and commitment, can create volatility and extra risk within an organisation. However, a number of effective structures can be used, and I urge that UFO groups uh, who are not yet involved should become involved in abduction research and to network with one another. The sort of, uh, um, I'll perhaps finish with some examples. Um, one thing that intrigues me too is a lot of, way much a lot of the abduction phenomena mimic established traditional things like uh, uh, certain kinds of um, spiritualist phenomena, um, communication, forms of communication. This is one particular case, we've got some examples here. Um, this particular woman I was dealing with had, was walking out to go to a barbecue one Sunday morning. Uh, nice sunny day, she was walking out the door with her husband and suddenly she said, she said, the sky turned orange and red and she saw all these brilliant lights all around her, bright balls of light uh, moving around her. And um, she was sort of uh, just, so she was somehow having some sort of abduction type experience, she thought. After a while, she kept asking, Who are you? Who are you? She sort of got the impression they were telling her something, she felt happy about it, but she could not be specific. She sort of felt it was a positive kind of experience. Um, and then the next thing, it all sort of turned off, the sky turned blue again, they went out on the on the, the, her and her husband talked about it, it's very understanding, thank goodness. And then they went out on their barbecue. Now, I asked the husband what happened. He said, well, as far as he was concerned, that, okay, they were going to the barbecue, they walked outside, then suddenly his wife collapsed on the floor, on the, on the, on the veranda of the house. She sort of started uh, shaking a bit, her hands were moving, and he, his computer operated. He had some computer paper that his son uses to scribble on. So he put that computer paper under her, he gave her a pencil in her hand, and she started producing what's really known in psychic cells as automatic writing. Now this woman was asking the question, it seems, what was your source? What is your source? This is the, the, the objects that she was writing that were around her. And so his hand was sort of moving. This is what I, what I call a chicken script. It looks a bit like a chicken has done a disco dance across the page. There are several pages of this. It doesn't tell you a great deal. And later on, you find that certain words start to emerge. These are just, these are just bits of it. And uh, they can't spell. Uh, no, she's asking me, what is your origin? You know, alpha, that looks a bit like Alpha San, Santori, badly spelled. And then, sort of a bit further on, um, you know, there's all sorts of strange things. 
happening, suddenly you get oh, a few other words. So, you know, star, 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 and you know, just repeat, 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 so more chicken strip, star, star, star. Then a few little diagrams. Um, mum, so father, mum, the child, something else. Know that she was doing this, he uh, has been in fact another picture which shows um, the mother and her son and another something behind which is certainly not the husband. <coughs> this is all sort of done in like, an automatic writing mode. And uh, then, of course, sort of went back to sort of more chicken script and back out again. Um, it, it, so it's, it's very, very complicated. This woman, in fact, has. Uh, had long, long into since in, in um, psychic type phenomena and has tried to exclude these aliens without much success. Um, she thought she had them on occasion, but in fact it turned out to be a spectacular um, failure. Um, she sort of told me that yes, she, they came from a particular night, um, but she sort of imagined that her archangel Michael was protecting her little blue flame, he was a bright, brilliant sort of um, Adamski type, lovely looking person, a uh, little Bright blue flag, that's how she knew it was um, the Archangel Michael. She was surrounded by white light, and her husband, uh, sorry, her son piped up, Oh, was that when we were sitting, was that when we were lying on the table in that big white, white room last week, Mummy? And now it's sort of suddenly realized, Oh, you know, this is not quite what was happening. So I say, it can be very, 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 very complicated. We find, for example, one other thing that seems to happen is that, just to finish up with, is that a lot of these uh, UFO abductions are associated with a particular sort of UFO. These tend to be orange balls, they're about uh, um, a metre across. Sometimes there's two of them, um, often executing fairly complex maneuvers, simply seen in the area. Some, in the UFO investigators, in fact, are now called the harvest lights. But I'm sorry, I'm not get over time. Um, questions? I don't know. Do you, okay, I've probably been doing over the last few. It's very labour intensive, as I've said. You probably deal with about half a dozen, to twelve people at a time at most, um, off and on over the months. Um, I've probably dealt, I suppose, with about twenty, twenty-five people <coughs> over the last few years. Um, I've probably been discussed about 30, between thirty-five and forty cases altogether with other people. So I suppose I'm looking at 30 to 40 cases, but as time goes on, they tend to fit more into what you might call the, well, the new traditional mould of, of, of the, the, the alien abductee. Uh, I can't, I don't know of any cases, for example, where, um, oh, I do know of the case, for example, people who, who are involved in the Chelmsford business in New South Wales, which is a mental hospital that was, uh, where they used deep sleep therapy for a number of years. In, um, totally discredited a few years ago, and of course, there all the stories, people out there on the streets who are sort of still suffering the effects of that. One or two people from that event um, originally went in to Chelmsford, it seems, with alien abduction type experiences. The, experience, the, the, the Chelmsford deep sleep therapy put, uh, used by, um, by hey, psychologists. Can you help them? Interrupting, I was just wondering your opinion as to whether you thought it was likely that a number of these people had. So far, I haven't come across any. Uh, and from my way of thinking, those people who say they've been abducted by some agency or aliens or whatever probably have been. I don't think that, that agency is some sort of Australian government agency, or even an American agency that's working through the Australian government at this stage. Uh, John? Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned before uh, this sort of process of soft soaping the alien abductees' experiences. Can you share with us a little bit about the book? You mentioned that 
gave children, uh, you know, the, the child's guide to a happy adoption fund? Oh, yes, yes, this case, uh, actually, this book that came out in the States, I think, towards the end of last year, this year, um, that rather concerned some of our abduction researchers. It's written by an American woman, and it's written for kids in Alaska. The children who are being abducted, if your child's being abducted by this book, it sort of shows that you're trying to walk around fast and grey and having a wonderful time. And some abduction researchers think that's a bit dangerous, that she you know, sort of a, and encourages children perhaps to, to yeah, okay, it's, you know, I'm just going away, with, I'm just being abducted, it's fine. Um, you know, with, my, uh, with your local friendly grey. Um, I, I don't think that's necessarily the right way to go about it. I'd rather prefer the Kelly Carl case where you sort of, <coughs> you're sort of dragged up and then scream out there's a lot more for us in the long term. You know, I'd, I'd rather like to see, if it was possible, I'd like to see our particular species that were renegotiate the conditions under which we may be abducted and have things done to us, <laughs> as opposed to this thing which has been going for a very long time. I think it's about time we sort of like, we did something like that or tried to do something like that. Oh, one final question. Um, sort of a two part question. We, we tend to be giving a lot of credit to the aliens for our psychic abilities from these experiences. So the first part is, has there been any studies on people who have been severely traumatised in ordinary ways, not alien ways, and do they, have, do they develop any skills like that from being traumatised? And the other thing is, is it possible that the abilities that abductees um, gain from these experiences is caused partly through the trauma, but also because they're forced into another reality, and therefore they have to go beyond their logical mind because they see aliens walking through the walls. And all oh, that's all right. The, the, the first question first. Um, uh, okay, there are other cases where people can be severely traumatised, like during war and things like that. Now, a lot of people who go through rather awful war experiences do have a, a totally new appreciation of life and the universe afterwards, but they don't necessarily start to have a whole series of poltergeist-type phenomena develop around them. What you might call the psychic or poltergeist phenomena that often occur after someone has been consciously or semi-consciously abducted seems to be something that's peculiar or specifically related to um, alien, alien type abductions. Um, you can certainly do comparisons with that. But however, you might say that in the cases of trauma, both people who are abducted by aliens and people who have tra war, war type trauma do however often experience a certain expansion of the mind in terms of looking at the world in a different way. Some quite, you know, for example, after a war, a lot of people might, might uh, because they're trying to become ministers, because that was often sort of the only way available, they might sort of take up religion in a professional setting. Nowadays, of course, people tend to sort of sell crystals and develop alternative bookshops and things like that. That's not necessarily bad. Oh, sorry, the second part of the question was what? The, uh, but could it be that um, they've developed those abilities because they've been forced into another reality by yeah. seeing all these things that you don't normally see? I, I think it's something there's an innate ability anyway. One of the ways that we try to provide sort of support to uh, people that are adding production type experiences is to get them to use their own resources. I don't really think too many resources to support them come from the other side, whatever it is. The most resources for people's rehabilitation come from themselves. The way you sort of, when you're trying to to support them, that you, you encourage those positive aspects of their personality that are being developed to let them say, look, okay, you know, we, we, we can help you get back to where you want to be or some new and large reality, but ultimately the resources are yours, we can help you develop them. We won't discourage them, we won't say, no, no, you mustn't stop reading people's minds or you mustn't stop doing this or you mustn't stop thinking these, thinking these awful thoughts and you, you, mustn't, uh, you must stop wanting to help whales and things like that. That's, you know, to a very large as far as I see a positive view. But very large, to, to what I can see, it's really a resource that's being developed from the people who are being abducted. It's not coming from the other side. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please thank Brian Dickerson.